by Dr. Sabini. All in favor? Aye, vote. Thank you. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. We have worked to modify our curriculum. We have worked to modify the literature. 
that our students are exposed to, we have worked to modify the images, the posters that they see hanging in that classroom. We have made efforts to diversify our staff, and we have. And we are trending in a positive direction to try to make a positive impact on cultural diversity um, within our community and hopefully our surrounding community. Um, can we do more? Absolutely. Can we do better? 100%. But I believe we are trending in a positive direction in the Ellis School District. And what I think bothered me the most and the leadership team and our faculty the most was the portrayal as Elwood being used as an exemplar of what districts are doing wrong. Um, in this particular area, I think we can be held in high regard as a district who is embracing um, the need for education to make a positive contribution um, to, again, the celebration of diversity that exists in our world. Um, and we will continue to do that. And we will try to, we will endeavor to continue to be leaders in our region. And we are viewed at that as such by many of our surrounding districts and our partners um, throughout the county and state. After the media report surfaced, we had spent a good deal of time answering phone calls and emails from parents who, who were right, justifiably upset by what occurred. We heard from many students. We spoke to them. We took the time necessary. And we really tried to make sure that we have our plans in place to learn and grow from this issue. After the media reports came out, I didn't hear from any residents. I didn't hear from any parents. I didn't hear from any students. I heard from people who lived outside our community who weren't aware of the, of the efforts our community and our district had made. And I had those conversations. And I made sure I enlightened those individuals about things that we were doing. We will do more. Um, we have a wonderful partnership um, established with the Huntington Anti-Bias Task Force. We will continue to grow and gain benefit from that partnership. We have our partnership with the Anti-Defamation League. This building that we are sitting in was designated a no place for hate school last year. Both Harley Avenue and John Glenn High School are working right now uh, to complete the application to also be identified as no place for hate schools. Uh, Boyd is sure to follow in the coming weeks. Um, ironically, Boyd is the building within our district where the Cultural Competency Committee was born and later expanded K-12. Um, we are doing many things correct, and again, we can do more, we can do better, we will work very hard to do that. But I do not want in any way for this very unfortunate, very upsetting, completely unacceptable incident to paint a picture of the Elwood School District or the Elwood community, because I don't think it's a reflection of what we, of what we teach. So, um, we will report out to the community our, our efforts as we progress through the year, things that we have done in the past and things that we will add in the future. Um, but I expect to be held accountable. I expect for those that I, I convey that we will do more and we will take a more direct approach. I'm committed to doing that. And, and that work has already started in the weeks that have passed since the incident. Any questions or comments from the board? I just want to say, um, being a student that graduated in 2008, the programs that you spoke of, the partnerships that you spoke of, we're not here in 2008. We're in here several years after that. So these are things the district has identified, recognized, and are working towards. So I do want to you know, just say that I'm proud of this district and where we were, but also where we're going. And I think the direction we're continuing to go is, you know, is inclusive. It is making the nature you spoke. So I, I appreciate the efforts that have been taking place. I look forward to seeing the efforts that do take place. Thank you, Mr. Tommy. Yeah. And it, you know, it's ironic that there was a board public meeting of the Board of Education last year where Dr. Paul led the community and the board through a, a discussion of all of our efforts um, through LICE, through our celebration of diversity. And I would love um, those who called to say, what is it that you're doing? Um, to view that video and really have a deep understanding of what we've been engaged in over the last four years. The things that we're doing moving forward are not in response to what occurred. It's because it's what we, we believe in our core value should be done. So um, I invite folks to watch the archive video of the presentation of the um, diversity committee. And you will see all the different things that we have done. And I appreciate the board's continued support, continued support of our efforts.
Reopening our schools has been the other major um, factor that has taken a great deal of our time, focus, and attention as it requires. We are 100% committed to making sure we can reopen our buildings in a safe and healthy way for our students, faculty, and staff. There are many, many accommodations that need to be made, not only to be in compliance with state guidance, Department of Health guidance, but also things that we felt exceeded state guidance so that our own comfort level would be satisfied for our students, faculty, and staff. So it has been a tremendous endeavor to work with all of our partners in the medical community and some other community resources um, to help advise us um, through this reopening procedure. Um, the plan has been shared in public forum for three and a half hours and archived to our website. We have follow-up Q&A sessions and presentations, and residents, thank you, um, continue to submit questions for clarification through that, through that reopening at elwood.k12.nyu.us email that is linked on our website. The, the frequently asked questions document has grown to 20 pages. Um, many of the questions can be answered within that document and also um, within the other documents that have been posted to the website. Please navigate our website when you have questions about our reopening. All the information that we've developed is in one central hub of all reopening resources. It talks about our plan. It talks about what we will do in response to positive uh, COVID tests. It talks about contact tracing that will take place if required. It, it demonstrates the guidance that we receive from the Department of Health. Um, some helpful documents that we received from the American Academy of Pediatrics New York chapter. Thank you, Dr. Stiki, for helping to facilitate that. And um, it's really all of the information that has been shared. We are trying to be 100% transparent with the community. Everything is available on the website. Each of our building principals also did an exceptional job of putting together building-specific information in a chart chock full of links for parents to follow about all of the different programs and procedures in place to respond to COVID-19 um, within each of our buildings. And within each of those documents, they also, on a building level basis, created a link for questions to be asked and answered. And I thank our principals and their teams for doing that. So what we are hopeful is that while there is certainly a new normal heading our way on September 8th, we want everyone to be very familiar with what that new normal looks like um, when their children enter our so please take advantage of reviewing the materials on our website, and if there are any outstanding questions, please feel free to submit them to that reopening at Elwood um, email address that we've created. This is Mark's, my assistant checks it every day, and we have been responding um, within 24 to 48 hours of receiving the question. Um, we are doing everything we can um, to make sure the safety of our students is in place when we reopen. We understand um, that we had to change some of our arrival and dismissal procedures because of the high percentage of parents that will be driving their children to school rather than using the school buses. And one of the things that we thought would be essential is adding a crossing guard to the Kenneth Avenue entrance. It's something we've been working on for some time, but we have received the commitment from the county, and there will be a crossing guard in place when school begins on Kenneth Avenue, in addition to the guards who are posted on the Elwood Road. Thank you um, the partnership with the county, county and the County Police Department to help that make to help make that happen. Um, there's also um, to respond to a question from a member of the board. There has been some evaluation of whether stop signs would be added um, to our entrance on Kenneth Avenue. Um, that project has not yet been approved, um, but we will continue to advocate and pester and annoy until in which time they add a stop sign to that. Um, we did not get the yes we were looking for yet. It took three years to get the crossing guard. We will keep working on the stop sign. Um, lastly, um, there was a matter brought to the attention of myself and the Board of Education regarding uh, a Huntington Town issue um, that is a primary concern to residents of the North Park School District. Um, to try to give a very Reader's Digest version of a very complex subject, um, the North Park School District and the Town of Huntington has benefited financially for a very long period of time by the LIPA owned power plant that, it, that is within the North Fork School District. Um, because of the tax payments paid by that plant to both um, the North Fork School District and to the residents of Huntington Town, um, there has been an outstanding lawsuit for quite some time now 
um, which I am intimately familiar with as both the prior superintendent of the Port Jefferson School District and a Port Jefferson resident, because there is a parallel um, litigation that was settled um, within the Port Jefferson School District. Um, but it's been an outstanding issue and a dark cloud hanging over um, both the residents of Northport and the residents of the town of Huntington for some time. LIPA contends that they have been overcharged in tax payments um, for decades. It talks about the capacity in which the power plant is used. Um, the, they claim that the plant is being taxed as is, it is being used at 100% capacity, whereas because it is an older, inefficient plant, they claim that it's being used at closer to 5% capacity. And they feel that in the courtroom they can demonstrate that their tax taxes should be subsequently reduced by about that 95%, and they should be able to collect back payments on the over um, collection of taxes that was made. Um, it primarily impacts the homeowners of the North Port School District and the North Port School District itself, but there is a trickle-down effect to all residents of the town of Huntington. So the Huntington Town Attorney reached out on an emergency basis to each of the superintendents of the district within Huntington Town to give an update of the situation and to try to convey all of this information to boards of education in the attempt to have school boards advocate for the potential settlement that was introduced to the town um, by that. What does that mean for Elwood? Well, in Elwood, every resident is going to receive a mailing from the town of Huntington in the coming days if you do not receive it today. I was given this preview copy. And it does a good job of illustrating um, the financial impact of a potential settlement and advertising a virtual meeting that Huntington will be holding on September 3rd. But the nuts and bolts are, if the settlement is entered into by the town of Huntington, an average annual increase because of the settlement to an Elwood resident would be approximately $26 per year. If the matter goes to litigation and in a courtroom, um, the town loses the case that LIPA has brought forward, the average increase to a homeowner in Elwood would be, a one, would be an annual increase of $265 and a one-time payment of $9,750. So when the Board of Education and the Legislative Committee that is chaired by Mr. Tommy and Mrs. Manalito, um, were, when they were all given this information, um, their need um, to advocate and, and um, put their thoughts in writing to the town attorney and to the town of Huntington um, became a matter of urgency, as it is clear the Huntington Town Board is preparing to take action on the issue. So the letter will be posted after this discussion to the website tomorrow. Um, so that everyone um, can be privy to a, co a copy of what was received by the town of Huntington, the town attorney, and Supervisor Lupinacci, who wrote and thanked the legislative committee for their submission of the advocacy letter. Um, but for, uh, I think, most folks who understand the nuts and bolts of the case, um, paying an average increase of $26 a year, as opposed to risking a balloon payment of $10,000, Fairly certain that if we struck all the residents of Elwood, that there would be strong advocacy for settlement. And I believe that was the position that our legislative committee took within their advocacy letter to the town. Any questions or comments from the board? So there has been some question about why uh, Mr. Tanio and my name as president and vice president has been signed that letter. It just so happens to be that that's the position that we hold as the board. We didn't act rogue from the board and go out and just publish a letter on our own. It was a product of the committee that we were elected by our fellow board members to check. So, when you sent out letters in the past, it was signed as vice president and member, but this year it's vice president and president. So I just want to be clear that our role as a vice president and president had nothing to do with the submission of the letter and had everything to do with the fact that we are legislative co-chairs and we signed our names to it and happened to hold those titles. Um, with respect to the process, 
us discussing it now at our, our next available board meeting so we can bring it to the public instead of discussing it first and mailing. We had to mail first because there was a postponement in the date from when it was. We, we had the conversation with the superintendent, the superintendent had the conversation with the town attorney. We found out about it. We had to advocate quick. We did not want to delay district business on something um, that could potentially financially harm our, our, our taxpayers. We're a fiduciary of the school district, and it's our responsibility to act on your behalf. So we did not want to delay district business. We wrote the letter, we sent it, and we want to make sure that it got in the hands of the board uh, members so that they can review it in a timely fashion so they can vote on it next week. So I just wanted to be clear about the process. There's no lack of transparency. It will be put up on the website tomorrow tomorrow because we're having the conversation here but it's either act then or don't act and for us it is it would be irresponsible for us not to act on behalf of our community any other comments Thank you, Ms. Weiss. Is there any comments? Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that the letter was, as a courtesy, was sent out to um, the rest of the board members and we were all able to see it before uh, it was sent out. Um, and that was done as a courtesy. It doesn't, from what I understand, it doesn't need to happen that way as the legislative committee has the authority to send a letter like that. Uh, but as a courtesy, the rest of the board members were CC'd on that letter. Thank you. All right. And just to piggyback with that, Dr. Hadigi, the reason the signatures affixed to the letter are just uh, Mrs. Mahmoud and myself is we are co-chairs. Um, we don't have a full board signed. I know that was a question on the committee as well as how come two board members signed it and not the board in its entirety. Um, it's because it came from a committee, which is chaired by two people. We don't have more than two board members on committees. That's new practice. In the last couple of years, we have a co-chairs um, co of our committees. Uh, that's new. And so two people signed it. If we had three board members on a committee, we'd have a quorum, we'd have a board meeting, and not work on the committees. So just to clarify that as well. I also want to state there's some uh, conspiracy theory that Mr. John Gross, who is our attorney, um, had some kind of personal interest in settling this for whatever reason, and that he represents both school districts. Um, Engerman and Smith represents a large majority of all the school districts on Long Island. So I'm not sure why that's floating around, but I just want to be clear to everybody that he not only represents us, he represents North Court, and he represents many, many, many other districts on Long Island. I actually believe that number is 54, and I think it's worth noting that um, because of the presentation given by the town attorney, um, there were a number of school districts within Huntington Town that took immediate action to write letters of advocacy to the Huntington Town Board. Um, I was certainly not alone in creating a letter to support the settlement. So, Dr. Steve, would you want to add something? Well, I just also wanted to remark on the reopening. Yes, we can go back. Okay. Well. Yeah, I just want, also wanted to just comment on the reopening. Um, I really am proud of our district about how much transparency and how many meetings we had and how much input that we had from the entire community, the staff, the teachers.
There's all the medical community that, that really stepped up and um, provided a lot of information. And it was a very, very collaborative um, effort and um, led by our superintendent and the board. And I really want to applaud uh, all of that input that was done to, um, you know, for a, for a, a very successful, hopefully, reopening. And I want to say that um, the rest of the area, um, some of the districts were not as transparent and they didn't have as many meetings of um, task force and, and the medical community as involved as our district was. So I just want to really applaud our district for doing that. Thank you. Uh, and I will say thank you as well. And, and I do want to add two additional comments. I appreciate your, your sentiment. Um, our reopen plan would not be possible without the collaborative nature of every individual employee within this district um, and our parents. Um, the partnerships that have been created during this time to make sure we are all focused on, on safety and health and welfare um, has just been extraordinary. And the willingness um, for some of the individuals employed by the district to, to try to use new technologies to engage students and to be willing to um, lead their comfort zone on a number of instructional initiatives and, as well as all the safety precautions we have to take. Um, there have been many questions and there have been many assurances that have been provided to our faculty and staff, but at the end of the day, they are all establishing our new normal and they're doing it while certainly with, with questions and concerns that we all have, they're doing it willingly, they're doing it collaboratively, and the, the partnerships should truly be celebrated. And I mean our teachers, I mean our support staff, I mean our custodial and clerical workers. Everyone is being asked to do something differently than what they've done in the past. And they are doing it in the best interest of our students. And I really want to applaud every member of our team for doing what is necessary to maintain the safety, health, and welfare of our, of our schools in order to reopen and to reopen well. We did receive some criticism in the spring. Um, regarding our distance learning plan. No one likes to be criticized. We are accustomed to being celebrated. And the commitment that we made in the spring to our students and parents was, what we had in place in the spring will be vastly different in the fall should we find ourselves in a virtual environment. The plan that we have presented to the community and that we have in store for our students is vastly different. And the calls that I've received from other district and building leaders of how did you accomplish that? My answer has been the same to all, with a collaborative and respectful relationship with our bargaining units. Um, they are all to be commended and applauded. I had a second one, but it escapes me, so I'll stop there. I just had one question. Um, I had a community member inquire. Um, there was some chatter about people not complying with their masks or making damage to their masks. Um, and sending their children into school. Can you just explain to the community um, in a case like that, uh, I would imagine that violates code of conduct, and can you just give us some more clarity to put people's mind at rest? 100% Ms. Mountain, and I did respond to some residents who brought that concern to my attention throughout this week. Um, the safety regulations that we put in place to maintain um, no infections or limited exposure to infections within our buildings uh, are non-negotiable. Um, when we talk about 100% mask compliance, that's what we mean. Um, we, Ariel, we have been given a charge to make sure we are maintaining the safety, health, and welfare of our students, faculty, and staff, and we will not allow non-compliance that will jeopardize that. So discussions of refusal to wear masks, poking holes in masks, frequently removing masks or sips of water, or all these other suggestions will not occur in the elder school district. Um, the code of conduct um, speaks to insubordinate behavior. We would consider non-mask compliance to be insubordinate behavior. And please, don't misunderstand. I'm not talking about kindergarten children who require frequent mask breaks. I'm talking about our secondary students who make calculated decisions about what to do. We have empowered teachers um, when it speaks to specifically masks, that if a student enters their classroom and they do not believe the mask is appropriate, um, acceptable, perhaps it is soiled, perhaps it is in ill repair, we have supplied every teacher with an unlimited amount of disposable masks, surgical masks, 
Some that we are receiving as a donation tonight, some that we received as donated by Suffolk County, and some that we purchased. Everyone will have an unlimited supply of masks so that if they determine that a child's mask is damaged or simply unacceptable, the teacher will um, direct them to wear the surgical mask, the disposable mask provided in their classroom. And, and that's non negotiable. And I understand um, there is some pushback from the community on mask wearing. It's non negotiable. Um, students cannot attend school without wearing a mask. There is a very, very limited number of medical exceptions, singular digits, and other accommodations will be made for those students um, to maintain their health and safety. Um, but discussions of disrupting masks and refusal to wear masks, masks um, those students won't be able to attend school. I, I can't make it any more black and white than that. Um, I just want to echo everyone's sentiments. I'm very proud of this school district. Um, uh, I graduated here in 1997, and to see 100 volunteers come together, the teachers, support staff, everyone really is being very flexible, and that's the word this year. We all need to be very flexible, um, and I encourage everyone at home, we need to unify as a community. I love Elwood. Um, I know we may not all agree at all, all times, but I think everyone needs to come together so we have a safe opening. We need to follow the protocol um, so we can all keep coming to school every single day. And I just encourage everybody at home, talk to your children, get them ready, and we support them. I think we'll be very successful and we will not have to close. But I am very grateful to live in such a great place. But I really hope that we can all unify around this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. I agree. I think, you know, always not unique to challenges and adversities. We are one who rises up and we meet the challenge that for us, so I don't see the reopening uh, position of the school being any different. No one is going to exceed expectations and do what we do best. I, I appreciate it and I agree. Any other comments pertaining to the superintendent's report at this moment? No. I think the board has done a longer job of speaking about the officer's own importance first. <laughs> Alright, thank you. We will move on to our first residential remarks. Do have so I just have to go over my blur um, in one second. The board encourages all residents to attend its meetings, and this section of the agenda affords them the opportunity to speak. Persons wishing to speak should identify themselves and any organization they represent at the meeting. Comments related to the district business or any agenda item should be kept as brief as possible and may not exceed three minutes. Policy 2351. Questions or comments concerning matters which are not on the agenda will be taken under consideration may be discontinued by the president. Public discussions of matters relating to staff, students, or others by which the reputation, privacy, or right to be process could be in some way violated is prohibited.
because of the limited use of that plan. So the one-time payment um, to the Northport School District is so that the school district has that money to offset increases to their budget that will be solely borne by the property owners in Northport. Then why are all the other residents of Huntington being penalized if we never benefited all these years in a school district? The North, the LIPA also pays taxes to the town of Huntington. So that payment um, financially benefits every Huntington town resident. The more direct benefit to those who live in Northport is the direct payments to the school district that offset that portion of their property taxes. So every Huntington town resident has benefited from that plant residing in Northport, but the residents of Northport have benefited financially more directly because of payments that are made directly from the to the school district. Right, but isn't the school district part of the budget like two-thirds of your, your tax bill? That's so, why some would argue that taxes in places like Northport and Port Jefferson were artificially low because they were offset by the large sum payments being paid by life. Right. I'm still having a hard time grasping why we all have to have why we would have to get hit with like nine grand. Because the amount that LIPA is charging that they have overpaid over time um, includes overpayment to both the town and the Northport School District. So for the town portion of the taxes that have been over collected, the portion that has been estimated by the Huntington Town Board is about $10,000 for the average homeowner. Tremendous amount of money. It's hundreds of millions of dollars. Right, that they were over. It, it's hundreds of millions of dollars, which is, I believe, why council um, for the school district and why the Hunter Town Board, I believe, will be advocating for the settlement. Because should LIPA go to litigation and a judge rule in their favor that these back taxes are owed, it's hundreds of millions of dollars. The reason why the settlement is attractive is because even though our, our tax payments will all go up dramatically in Northport in a minor fashion in Elwood, is because as part of that settlement, LIPA would not be able to litigate for back payments. So the Elwood district, <laughs> It's three minutes. If you have another question, I can answer. No, just to clarify, so it's only gonna go up about $200, $200 a year or so for but it's going to go up exponentially for the Northport North District? Northport School District residents will see a sharper increase to their taxes because the percentage of their school portion of the taxes they have to pay will increase because of the removal of the portion being paid by LIPA. Just, just, just in case I may have lost it. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's, you're, if you're looking in comparison to Elwood, if the case gets settled, Elwood's looking at a $26 increase Northport is about $370. Not too good. Yeah, not good. Not the, the flyer I just shared with Mississippi is not privilege information. That's a mailing that is going home to every uh, Huntington Town resident. So if you did receive it today, you'll likely receive it in the coming days. But you're happy to have my copy to help give you a better yeah, illustration. I think I'll clarify your question. Yeah. The number is large, and the rationale is not understandable, to be honest. It's very you know, unique because why would it, us who has not received financial remuneration from LIPA have to pay a bill that Northport has been receiving? And I think, you know, being a good neighbor, I think we share the wealth in that, that's the logic behind it, and because you're assessed through the town portion of your taxes, um, if the lawsuit goes through and LIPA wins, they have to collect that money, the sharing of it is throughout the entire town, with Northport taking the highest hit of returning the money back to LIPA, if you will. But it is, eye-opening because I don't know many families, especially in these conditions right now, that can handle a ten, fifteen thousand dollar one time hit to their taxes, let alone our senior population wouldn't love to see a annual increase of anything above what we have to raise for the school taxes and your norm in your bill, but an additional uh I mean two hundred and sixty-five dollars the first year and then a one time balloon payment. So Dr. Bowser, can you just explain so just for clarity for the audience, um Northport was actually receiving these large payments as a source of a revenue stream in addition 
to the Huntington portion going into the tax base, correct? I'm going to use my metaphor um, that many poor Jefferson presidents got sick of hearing. Um, you go out to dinner. There are 10 people at the table, and you equitably divide the bill, and everybody pays 10%. Well, in host communities like Port Jefferson and, and Northport that have LIPA plans, LIPA says, we have deep pockets. No, 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 no. Let us pay 50% of the bill. Um, so what happens is that LIPA said, you know what, we're leaving the table. So now the bill for the dinner hasn't changed, but how the check will be divided has changed dramatically because LIPA has ceased in making their contribution to pay the bill. And not only that, they want to be repaid for the 100 previous dinners that they paid half the bill for. So Northport, so Northport School District um, has um, no choice but to maintain their budget at the current level. But when you remove the payments being made by LIPA, there's only one way to regain that revenue, and it's by raising local property taxes or the other option they is decimating the program in Northport. Um, that, the Northport Board of Education has a very difficult task ahead of them. They have to find the balance in how much they can believe they can reduce from their budget while the state is taking away 20% of aid, and how much they feel their residents can su support an increase. It's a very difficult balancing act, a lot of work, a tremendous amount of conversation. To offset that large task in front of them, as part of the settlement, there has been an offer from LIPA to um, help offset some of the loss with a $14 million one-time payment. Thank you, Ben. I want to make sure that everybody really truly understands, but I think Mrs. Savitsky. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Savitsky, if you don't mind, would you mind if I open the floor to other residents? And then if there's no other questions or after, we can back up. Yes, you also could, but I'll also see how we do Hello, my name is Agatha Bell, and I'm just representing myself and my children, uh, and my husband, but, um, so I wanted to uh, ask a couple questions, but first I wanted to echo uh, what Dr. Siddiqui said earlier. Uh, thank you so much. Dr. Bossert and all the staff and all the bargaining units for all the work that was done this summer. I was definitely one of the critics in the spring, but I am a cheerleader now because the work that I have seen done this summer is so impressive and inclusive, and the end result as a parent and a taxpayer and a person during the pandemic, um, I think is very thoughtful, very thorough. I just keep saying it's so thoughtful of every detail. It's very thorough. It takes into account any, any, anything that could possibly happen. I'm really impressed and I'm really thankful. And um, I wanted to say that to you tonight. Um, it, it, you had a very different summer than some of us residents have. So I do appreciate, I saw a lot of the work that went into it. Um, I do want to say, um, uh, some people don't like the high, you know, they criticize the hybrid model, and I wasn't sure about it. Sorry, I touched them. Um, today, uh, my son, who was on the task force committee, uh, was musing in the back seat, just like thinking aloud, and he said, I think this is going to be good, as a, you know, being in the school for the, the high school for the first time as a ninth grader, with only half the kids there. Um, I could hear that like he was calm about it and that he's working through his nerves about going to a new building. And he said, this is actually gonna be really, really good. You know, we're gonna get to see the building, go through the hallways, and it won't be crowded, and we won't be as, in, I, I'm gonna say intimidated, he didn't say that, but I think as ninth graders, they won't be as intimidated. Um, so there's silver linings in all of this, and we just have to look for them, I wanted to say. And I wanted to say thank you. Um, what I was going to also ask about when I was looking through the agenda items, so I, I did see um, that some athletic transportation, field trips, things like that, uh, were transferred to buy PPE. 
which makes sense to me. Now, is this stuff that didn't happen, or is this stuff that's not going to happen? And then I have a follow-up to that question. Okay. Yeah, and, and first of all, thank you very much for your okay. kind remarks. We appreciate it, and we appreciate your partnership, and we appreciate that your son's involved in the task force. It was nice to have our students involved in the dialogue. Um, we, we had the opportunity to make uh, budget transfers to address immediate needs. Um, Ms. Duncan, our business official, could um, go far more in depth of how that process works, but I will simplify it by saying we have the ability to keep our, our budget codes fluid during the year when priorities arise. All of the health and safety items um, that we needed to purchase or um, money we needed to expend regarding PPE, um, the Chromebooks, the temperature readers, um, the barriers um, to the tune of $80,000 um, had not been budgeted for. Um, so Ms. Duncan, in order to make sure that everything was crystal clear for our board, for our internal owners, for our extended owners, and the community, had to make transfers from other areas of the budget. Um, by no means does that mean some of the codes that were shifted, um, it doesn't mean those things won't occur. It means we have the ability to replenish those codes at a later date. One of the things that happened of a positive nature financially, a lot of financial uncertainty, one positive piece of information is that a bill was passed by the state of New York that allows this administration, this board, to um, use some of our reserve funds that had been identified for other areas, the teacher's retirement system, the employee's retirement system, the capital reserve, and apply those, that funding, to expenses incurred due to COVID-19. That's unprecedented in the state of New York, um, that a reserve that had been designated for one purpose can be used on an emergency basis for another purpose. There is also the opportunity for some of those funds to be replenished through the federal government, a FEMA-type situation where these purchases were made, this money was expended um, due to a global pandemic, so there will be some aid associated return to the school district. I don't think it'll be dollar for dollar, for it, but we think some of that funding will come back. And also some of the savings from last year and that we were able to carry over within our legal limit can be applied to those expenses that we incurred this year. So when we transfer money out of an athletic code, that doesn't mean athletics won't work. It means we needed to demonstrate where is the money coming from right now, and then we can replenish that code when money is either taken from reserves, replenished by aid, or just adjusted from that way. Like that was the simple version, by the way. Yeah. If Lorraine had explained it. <laughs> I would have understood. Um, my follow-up to that is, I did see in tonight's, um, you know, where you just say, you, you, the consent agenda, there, there are athletic supervision personnel being approved. So I was hopeful that, I don't know what that job is, Athletic supervision personnel. Mm -hmm. Chef. Okay, great. And um, I, I wanted, I wanted to ask. Um, so that makes me hopeful that are are you allowed to make a personal, like a, a district decision on athletics? I know Suffolk County uh, superintendents, right, are saying we can follow Governor Cuomo's uh, guidelines. And then, do we decide as a district, or do we just follow Suffolk County? Great question and a bit confusing, so allow me to answer the first part of your, of your question correct, uh, clearly. Um, we are approving athletic supervision, some coaches, some co-curricular advisors, um, all of that is being approved, hoping that there will be a program for athletics. Um, if athletics does not occur, those, position, those positions would be rescinded at a future meeting, and the appointment to the board is contingent upon the work taking place. So for an athletic supervisor, they won't um, be compensated in any capacity if they don't have the ability to perform the job that they were appointed to. So these are all contingent positions in the event that we can host athletic events and functions, which would be coaches that have been previously appointed, athletic supervisors, things like that. The second part of your question is a bit more complex. Um, the governor gave an executive order that athletics, um, low-risk athletics, could begin again at the discretion of regions and districts on uh, September 21st. Uh, that came as a surprise to most district leaders. Um, he also defined low-risk athletics differently 
than the Suffolk County governing body, Section 11, does. So what Governor Cuomo called low risk and what Section 11 calls low risk are, were two different lists. Um, tennis, golf, track um, were definitively low risk, and there's some others that, uh, like field hockey and soccer, um, that might be defined differently locally. Um, Section 11, um, who makes recommendations to all districts within Suffolk County, met on an emergency basis. Um, their board of directors has an executive director who's compensated for that position, and then representatives of superintendents and athletic directors from across the county. They voted unanimously not to make a decision. Um, they voted to um, gain more information, see what health and safety requirements would need to be met in order to do this, um, look for solutions regarding transportation, because remember, you can't put a full team of students on a bus and move them from district to district, and also for a solution to the overwhelming number of districts that are currently operating in a cohort model. So think about John Lynn High School, where we have only letters A through K and on Monday, Tuesday, nobody on Wednesday, and then the remainder of the alphabet on Thursday and Friday. Well, as we don't alphabetically separate our teams, how are those students returning to school? And how are we then transporting them for contests? So there's a lot of unknowns to make a decision of whether or not we can have a fall season of athletics. So what Section 11, the governing body for Suffolk County, um, decided was to wait to gain more information and have informed discussions about whether or not this was feasible. Um, Nassau County, Section 8, voted not to have athletics before January. News Day, incorrectly reported, News 12 incorrectly reported, that Suffolk County had unanimously voted to begin athletics. They did not. What actually occurred at that meeting was we, we vote not to take a vote um, and to gain and evaluate more information. Nassau County changed their vote today to match Suffolk. So now the entirety of Long Island is waiting for what do those health and safety guidelines look like, what does transportation look like, what is the solution to the cohort model before making a decision about a fall season? So right now, um, the correct report to our community is undecided on athletics. Now you asked a procedural question, and I'm sorry that we've gone well over three minutes. Um, the procedural question is, it's me talking, now. So it, it's me. Um, I didn't expect this question to be asked tonight, but we are prepared. Um, Section 11 can make a recommendation that they, as a governing body, are recommending the start of the fall season. The Elwood School District and the Elwood Board of Education can still opt out of that season, and we do not feel there are enough safety guidelines in place. If they vote not to have a season, we can't create one. Um, so it's a direct relationship, but they first have to give a green light, and then we decide whether or not to participate. If they say red light, no decisions to be made here. Okay, thank you. And if I have 10 seconds, I wanted to ask, who is this George Nelson, and what is the artistic choreography? There's a contract in the middle. There's like a contract. Can someone? It's not It has to be the dance choreography. Oh, okay. You oh, were okay. drafting the marching. I see. Okay. The choreographer on March of that. Thank you. I was like, I was trying to figure it out, um, which I think is a worthwhile expense if we have a marching band season. You know, the word drill in there was a little confusing. Drill the name. Drill. It, oh. Yes, that's, I think, like the drill major and stuff of that nature. So. Okay. And I just want to say one small thing about the LIPA thing. I like your analogy with the restaurant, but to me, when I was listening to it, and thank you, Liz, for bringing it up. Um, when, when like you're at a restaurant table and there's 10 people, but Lyra gives half, I think what is happening now is people from another table are being asked to kind of chip in to help them so they don't have to have the shop. Is that kind of what's happening? Like we are at a different table. Like but we're never we're helping. Maybe at the table that's 10 people, where it's, we're at that table. Are we? Or is that all just like the more 10 more no, They never In my analogy, which didn't, which didn't work as well here tonight as it was in the past, <laughs> um, we're already seated at the table and paying a reduced portion of the bill. Um, but to go back to the analogy, oh. um, Northport got to order steak and we got a side salad. Okay, that makes more sense to me. Okay. All right. That works.
and I'm handing all the weight over here. I don't get it. Okay. <laughs> I see. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Uh, just for a second for the athletics again. So, um, if they decide, Section 11 decides to go forward with some guidelines that they produce, uh, I know the New York State Physical Educators, mm -hmm. whatever, they have their own guidelines and the state has their guidelines. Um, so would you be deciding as a board or would Mr. Shanahan and Dr. Bosser be deciding if we're a go? How is that procedure? The typical governance structure would apply that Mr. Shanahan and I would confer and make a recommendation to the board which they could accept or reject. So it would be a board uh, acceptance or rejection of following section 11 or not, right? 100%. Okay, thank you so much and thank you for all the great work. I'm really impressed with this summer work and I think it's going to be safe and phased and everyone, and I'm impressed with all the bargaining units and all the partnership. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other resident remarks? Please come to the podium, come to the microphone. Good evening, I'm Pat and Do you have a hard copy of the letter? I'm your friend. No problem. No problem. Uh, this is dated August 17th, so we just found out about this a couple of days ago. My concern is that it's urging direction to be taken from August 11th. Uh, theoretical deadline. The theoretical deadline was imposed by LIPA. The Huntington Town Board um, failed to take action on accepting the settlement. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just, I been here for a while. I, I totally understand. I, I don't think you understand my question. On August 17th, mm -hmm. you urged the town to take action prior to August 11th. They had um, moved that deadline. LIPA gave flexibility and was waiting for Huntington Town to take action. So I, have, I apologize. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I do have some things I wanted to clarify and wanted to know if you could clarify, but, but first off, on August 17th, you urged the town to take action on August 11th. You would need a flux capacitor and a time machine for the town to go back, correct? I, no, I apologize. I know they moved the deadline to the 3rd. Right. I know it was originally set up to be the 16th. Mm -hmm. I know the vote was going to be the 29th. Mm -hmm. I know it's approximately 63% that the school board gets, and I think we get as a town, 37% of that light of chunk. I think what they're going to be losing is approximately about 20% of their annual budget. The 14 million that was mentioned, it's seven years. 2.5 first year, scaling down 2 million the next six years. It's only for that school board. Poor Jeff did not get the deal. Island Park is a little upset. But this is not a singular action that light took against just to have money in it. It took this on its four legs of plants. Correct. Because in their own reports, they say that you're spending 184 million a year. And legacy plan taxes, but again, their reports also say that their plans are old, uh, well, I, uh, facing obsolescence is what the new reports say. They were looking at repowering feasibility for poor Jeff as well, you must know that, but it's going to cost too much. So, in the past 10 years, you have PSCG and a lot of funding coming through them for the solar issues, and it actually is offsetting this thing. So, the power service agreement is what this whole thing kind of comes down to at the end of the day, when that's why it rolls out, was it 2027? Because 2028 is when that agreement expires. But we found out by the fine print of the, the amended and restored power service agreement, Lyman can essentially pull out any point they want, that grid could, they can sell the property. Nobody is bound by anything. So the argument that I have, and I, if I don't represent a group, but there's a group called Lyman Lies, there's another one called Concerned Taxpayers Against Lyman. Now, I helped them out for the past year and a half, I'm very versed in this. I don't usually stand up unless I have to. The, Conspiracy theory, as you put it, yeah, there are a lot of people, especially now, that, that run them up with things. There was concerns about uh, our school's attorney, Mr. Gross, having represented currently the other school district. The 14.5 million is specifically for them, and it's to, if you will, sweeten the deal. It's, I believe, 1% of their annual budget. We don't get that, as Dr. Bartlett said, because we specifically didn't receive any direct benefit as a host community. What we do is hunting. 
Now, the North Port East North Port School District lost its third party beneficiary case. That's out on appeal. Our town also has a case on appeal. I believe there's three cases in total, it might be roughly. Part of the settlement agreement is to drop all appeals. And within there is also the transmission and distribution and all these other little power service agreements. We're told that we don't have anything at stake, but we do. If we give up our rights now, because of what's happening in North Port East North Port School District, we waive our rights to all appeals for whatever LIBOR wants to say to us in terms of reassessment and value for the transmission and distribution. Uh, there's several contracts that, that are expiring within this time, and it's a, it's a house of cards, if you will. A lot of it seems to go down to that, that fuel service agreement because it's a oil burning plant. Mm -hmm. But by 2030, 2025, we've already got rollouts for new, you know, things that would actually reduce the use of the plant, which would then cause or necessitate, necessitate a reduction in value for it. Yes? So you've got a time machine that you want the town to go back. All right, thank you for your time, then, I guess. I just have a quick little question. You know, is that Camden? Is York? that Mercury? Sorry to interrupt. You want to take interest over it because their life is? You said there's a pamphlet coming up next week. That's not what I said. I'm just being honest. Okay, I'm sorry. There's a letter thank that we have received as a district. There's one that's circulating to the community. Maybe you received it today, maybe in the coming days, not next week, because um, the board, the town council meeting is on September 3rd. Okay. So no, I know that next week we can about that for dates. So I would imagine the town is disseminating that information uh, prior to that. The, the town one, right? Well, there was, I, I'm very close to this. I've been watching this for a while. Yeah. I apologize if you weren't given fine. all the information. You know, you were given the truth, but not the whole truth, and definitely not nothing but the truth. To say this doesn't affect us is, is narrow-mindedness to look at it that way. It no, means, I think you've been advised that it does affect us, and I think that was the position that the legislature made tip because of our guidance from our council right. and uh, the direct impact to our community. Now I understand your position as if we um, you know, want to kick the can and see what happens with um, the appeals. Oh, no, 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 I don't, just so we're clear, it's not so much this, uh, it, it's not the math that's on the table, it's the, the words. It should have gone to the math department, somebody in the English department should have looked at it and see what it insinuates and leaves. Just, so just speaking to the legal, context of the letter, I'm speaking legal, for the lawsuit itself, I think we're passing ships here, I think. But I'm, you're talking to the date of August 11th. Well, yes, I... It I, was I, the date that it was the original lawsuit date, and that well, that was the, had their feet held to the fire, that they had to make a decision by. Um, that's what they were told, that was not a legal decision, yeah. as you found out. Sure. Life had been contacted, if I'm not mistaken, the town attorney, and I believe the Stone Court attorney, who was also our school attorney. Correct. So it did say from uh, the letter, what was it? Uh, I believe the exact words are, our attorneys have advised us success does not appear likely given the court's ruling. Mm -hmm. Our attorney is their attorney. So I know for a couple of years, this individual and other individuals were running around fighting, getting a lot of money, apparently for an unwinnable case. That was a, has me a little concerned. Just within there, the, the transparency is lacking. Uh, a little bit further now, it says, it says uh, our understanding of the information provided is different is the actual impact on public homeowners could be significantly greater. That's just for this settlement based off of this tax certiorari. Mm -hmm. So again, my concern is not so much this certiorari, but what that agreement says. I, I consider it unagreeable. To use the town attorney's exact words, not too long ago, he called it unagreeable. So all of a sudden, everybody's decided we can't win this. There is no precedent set to actually say this. There's no evaluation ever set on the plan because they say they don't have any value at all. Actually, sat in court, wasted a lot of time, only for them to send it up for this arbitration. Life got sick of waiting, and now here we are. There are contracts that are up for renewal. There's a lot of money on the line with this, and they're basically trying to pass this debt off to the community once again. So they're going to be repowering off site. We're sitting, like I said, it's, it's right. discussing I, I, the plan. Mr. Deegan, I don't want to cut you off, but I no, no, we no. do have a policy for board that it's no, not. No, thanks for your time. I've tried to have flexibility with everybody. I've tried to afford it to you as well. I, I want to thank you. keep the meeting moving if you don't mind. Right? Absolutely. You sound very well versed in this. And yeah, I apologize that I came late. You know, I, I do have a lot of information. I mean, sure. no ill will. It's just there is so much for this. We use the board of it's education. We have an email address. We have phone numbers listed. You, as a resident, reach out to us. You are elected by the community I to will, yes. be there. Um, Again, this appreciate you coming to the meeting because that's kept the hard part. North but also, North Port, please reach out to us. Be in the Yeah. Thank you. You sound very honest. Thank, well Thank you very much. Mr. Zavitsky, do you want to wait until the second residential mark?
Or do you still have questions lingering and want to? <laughs> we always, you know, when it's our language, we uh, encourage all of you to speak in our meetings. So we do. So please, but I, I hope a lot of this was answered. And thank you. That brings us up to our next agenda item, which is board recognition of donations. Tonight we have two donations um, on the agenda. Um, and we are going to recognize one that is very near and dear to our heart, the um, family of our former Board of Education President, Julia Freed, um, is donating a tree in her honor. So I will take that action at the first for the Board of Education to consider. Be resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education, may I have a motion, sorry, may I have a motion for the following for it to be resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education hereby accepts a donation of an eight foot tall cherry tree to be planted on the school property with gratitude from the Freed family and Timothy Caputo with an estimated value of $400 to honor and commemorate the legacy and dedication of Julia Freed, past Elwood Board of Education president to the Elwood School District. I have a motion for that donation. Motion by Mr. Marmolito, seconded by Dr. Siddiqui. Questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Zero. Thank you. Uh, our second um, donation this evening is for disposable masks. Uh, may I have a motion for the following? Be resolved that upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, the Board of Education hereby accepts the donation of disposable masks with gratitude from Mr. Michael Mark Antonio with an approximate value of $1,000. I have a motion. Motion by Mrs. Uh, Mr. Scarola. Second by Mrs. Mamolito. Questions or comments? None. I will just make a quick comment. I do want to thank Mr. Mark Antonio for his generous donation. Um, as we know, PP is not only was not only hard to obtain, but it is uh, not cheap, and the district has covered a large expense that wasn't budgeted for. So every little bit helps. So we thank him. Um, we have a motion. We have our second. All in favor? Ms. Um, Weiss. Thank you. It's 5-0. Okay. We are moving on to our consent agenda. May I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion by Mr. Scroll, seconded by Mrs. Mamolito. Questions or comments? Ms. Weiss, is that a question? Are you raising your hand for all in favor? Do you have a question, Ms. Weiss, or are you all in favor? All to the questions and comments, Ms. Weiss. Seeing none, all in favor? No, okay. That's 5 0. Thank you. Alrighty, we are up to our second residence remarks. If I could just add a comment in here, I apologize for the brief delay. Um, for all of the members uh, on the personnel item who I uh, suggest to either watch via live stream or um, watch the recording of the live stream later tonight. Um, for everyone that was on the uh, board agenda for personnel appointment tonight, uh, I would like to point out that they were unanimously appointed by the board and welcome to the Elwood family. Go Knights, we look forward to seeing you when the school year begins. Thank you, Ambassador. Yes, we look forward to welcome to the team. All right, that brings us up to our second residence remarks. I'm going to read our board one more time. Do I have to this part? You can just say that rules still apply. The rules still apply. I, um, I, I just got a text from a friend watching from home uh, and asked me to ask about if, uh, with the sports, back to uh, that topic, um, if would the idea of intramurals uh, be considered or is it just too, like, far down the road, like when is the discussion happening? I know Dr. Foster, you have what inside, you know, you are part of all those committees, um, but someone asked me to bring up maybe the idea of would intramurals be considered if like the idea of like the travel and the buses, um, and I So we really need to take time to review what the health and safety guidelines are. Um, we need to understand that in a phys ed uh, setting right now, um, because of the 
super spreading respiratory risk um, during athletic competition, while six feet of social distancing applies in a classroom, it's 12 feet in, in phys ed. So one of the things that we're really needing to evaluate is what appropriate social distancing looks like in something that's a lab athletic competition. Um, tennis, golf, I, I, I can see it. Soccer, field hockey, I'm struggling. Um, the governor uh, made a statement how volleyball and football could practice but not compete. Um, so there's not a lot of rhyme and reason to some of the decisions that were made in isolation by the governor of New York without consultation from the New York State High School Athletic Association, certainly not within the sections within each region. So it's really undecided. When I think about how much we have to restrict of student mobility, contact, and all the other safety protocols to have instruction take place, I just, I'm, I'm having a difficult time envisioning how those same safety guidelines can be appropriately applied to athletics. Um, I also would want to be very careful that if we are to make accommodations to allow athletic or intramural activities to take place, we also better find a way to make sure the marching band, the chorus, the band, and all of the other activities that our students engage in after school um, can take place as well. Musical theater. You know, these are all things that have been paused to focus on health and safety and make sure that instruction is taking place. Why athletics is being viewed in isolation just not sure. I have a very hard time explaining to the students in our marching band or the students who want to engage in musical theater of why we can't do those things, but we can play soccer or film or volleyball or football. I'm struggling with that. So I'm waiting to see what the health and safety regulations are before commenting. So I understand the question about intramurals, but I feel premature in response. Okay. Thank you. And, uh, I just like to say I have three children, and one does marching band, one does soccer, and one does the theater and sings. So I totally understand, and that's been on my mind too. And um, I have to say I've been really um, calmed by the idea that you've said repeatedly our, our shared goal of getting as much normal as possible, as safely as possible, and getting them back in. And I am heartened with knowing that. You want all the same things for the children. 100%. Yeah. New York State had a phased reopening plan. I believe it's appropriate and responsible for school districts to have a phased reopening plan. Phase one of reopening is focusing on instruction. Mm -hmm. um, that is our primary goal. When we feel confident that we've done that in a safe and healthy way and we are not seeing um, an increase to our infection rate for either our district or the region, then I believe we can begin opening the valve a bit more and looking at what other activities can come back into our reality. Um, to do them all initially, without having data to measure the success of our instructional program, I feel would be a bit irresponsible. And again, I was, was really somewhat surprised to hear the governor's data of September 21st to consider athletics. Um, if he had said January 1st, I don't think anyone would be surprised, um, because that would have given a, a fair time um, to measure the success of restarting our instructional program. Keeping in mind, we're starting an instruction program with only 50% of our secondary students reporting age that. And we are making major modifications to do so safely. Um, I, I wholeheartedly believe that athletics will be back. I am not as confident that they will be back this fall. Thank you. No, I appreciate understanding. Thank you. It all sounds reasonable. Thank you. Let's speak. I'm not using any more analogies with you. So I like the question. <laughs> what, what, would, what percentage of students are coming back, um, say six to 12, you know, for the hybrid model, what percentage are staying home? The total number of students, K to 12, whose parents opted um, to keep them in a virtual environment is approximately 14%. Hmm. And what about six to 12? I think, Dr. Hill, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the elementary secondary breakdown is about 50%. Yeah? Pretty close. Okay. Thank you. Any other residential remarks? Mr. De Deegan?
Yes, sir. Okay, I just want to take the time to actually go over a couple of points. Uh, it's not an end-all situation in the life of thing where if we lose, we have to pay ten to twenty-five thousand dollars. It's a scare tactic. It's actually been used multiple times over. The valuation has not been set. Everybody's home will be valued differently. Uh, it's also no guarantee that the judge will automatically rule exactly what life wants, which is ninety percent back for ten years. It's, it's like a strong art technique. You will charge me ninety percent. I will sell for fifty. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, too, we would have to pay right away and move to something kind of control or then come out as an increase in taxes. It wouldn't be just some lump sum. Uh, I am curious, I don't know if you could or would tell, but how was this presented to our school district when it's considered by East Northport that it doesn't mean anything else? I know you'd said that every other district was notified, but as a member of a group that's kind of lighting life up, the only district I've heard of that actually wrote a letter was our district. No, I, I, if, if I'm mistaken, I'm just, sure, I'm just curious about how it was you presented can. to us. That would ease people's minds, I think, sure, we could. conflict of interest of Mr. Gross. And I'd love it, to answer just, that. If you don't mind, we'll let Dr. Bosser answer that because we are in the company. Yes, again, um, the Huntington Town Attorney asked for an emergency meeting which each of the superintendents representing the districts in the town of Huntington. Um, it was a virtual meeting held after August 11th, um, explaining that the deadline had been set by Light of, but um, asked by request for extension by the uh, town of Huntington to take action, because they elected not to take action prior to the deadline, as you know. Um, there were a number of school districts um, who chose to either make phone calls or write letters in support. I think if you look at the Half Hollow Hills website, you will see an identical letter to the one sent by the Elwood School District. Well, that's what heavy concern was the common language I've been seeing over and over. Okay. Years. You also have to understand that the district compensates and operates under the advice of council. Well, I know that that advice currently has the North Wales Public School District that I thought of the council because of what they were doing the past year. So, Mr. Speaker, I, if I may, um, although Mr. Gross and Ingram and Smith represent multiple districts, um, it's as if you and I have the same position. Where, you know, we are going to be given information that's pertaining to each of us. Correct. Right. Specific to not. us, so I would hope no, that our council is not right. ill-advising us specifically. I don't think that would be the case with Aaron Smith. We've been retained in this council for many years, and we've been guided through many challenging projects. And we do not sit currently in court. We are. Not, we do not have him on the retainer to appear for us in any litigation during the search inaugurate. He, he represents us in other matters. I mean, with, with all respect. We're not going to say he's a search yard expert, right? Unless we have for our school district a search yard expert, which would be phenomenal. I, I think an important point to make, and Mr. Tommy, please allow me the flexibility to do so, is that while this is certainly a forum for this conversation to be discussed, I think it's important um, for you and for the residents of the community to understand the board has no has no standing in this matter. Um, no, I agree. They, That's why you're concerned about they, the letter. Well, I think the board has the responsibility and the legislative committee took action to advocate on what they felt was in the best interest of the taxpayers. Um, but I believe Sir, the... Nope, you can't you interrupt me. I did interrupt you. Yeah, you have. I think that the... You over talk. I okay. think... I waited for an hour. You can wait another hour and I'll finish speaking. Oh, goodness. Thank I you. think that the forum for having this conversation is um, with the Huntington Town Board, who will be taking action on the matter. Also, just distributed a letter that you're going to receive in your mailbox from Huntington Town, indicating that date of September 3rd and all of the relevant information associated with it. And I asked that that was the plan that was hired by that was provided by Mercury, where there was a conflict of interest question. Dr. Bosman, if I may, the time is expired. Mr. Deacon, we appreciate that you coming to the podium and the residents' remarks. If seeing none, we will close this portion of the agenda. Thank you. I, we've afforded a lot of the flexibility this evening, so no, I, I, I appreciate your input, but we do need to move on with our meeting. Absolutely. Thank you. There's only one resident that hasn't spoken this evening. Uh, opening the floor back up to residents' remarks. Seeing none, we move on to the agenda. This portion of the agenda, I will ask for a motion to adjourn the meeting. A motion by Mrs. Scarola, seconded by Mrs. Mamalito. All in favor? Sorry guys, and that is a 5-0
for being as closed. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Everybody have a safe summer. Enjoy the remainder of it. And we look forward to seeing you virtually and in person in the coming weeks.